Hi, kitty cats. I am Amethyst Deherrick, your hostess for Gender Identity Weekly, a weekly discussion about identity and gender from the contributors and guests of the Purple Paw Publications website, genderidentitytoday.com. This content here is brought to you by subscribers of genderidentitytoday.com. So if you're already a subscriber, thank you so much for your ongoing support. You know really dang well the subscribers not only receive new content directly to their email inboxes as soon as it publishes, but are also able to interact with every one of the contributors directly, including me, which who doesn't want to interact with me, right? So... If you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as the other podcasts, videos, and written articles by all of our contributors, please consider subscribing using the links you're going to find down there in the show notes. Today, I am extremely excited to be speaking with Artemisia Divine. Artemisia is a sexual fantasy expert, a sexologist, and an author. And I read, Artemisia, I read on your, your website, there was a quote that just hit me so hard. You say, sex is never just physical, it is an embodied story. Mm. And every single one of us is an embodied story. That's what identity is to me. And so that's why I'm so interested in talking to you. So thank you so much. Hello. Welcome to the show. We're going to have such an interesting conversation, aren't we? <laughs> I think so. You know, usually I say the person's name and then I say hello. And, you know, I didn't, I actually did the whole introduction this time, which sounded, you know, far more uh, professional, which means everybody listening is going to go, did Amy have coffee today or something? What happened? <laughs> Quick answer, no. <laughs> uh, oh, that's what did it. <laughs> the lack of caffeine. That may be what it is. Yeah. So... So it's really fascinating to me. I also saw a certified somatic sexologist, and I think I'm unsure a distinction there, but it'd be cool to hear. Before we go anywhere else, actually, I'd love to hear, I mean, like something snapped inside you that made you say, I've got to understand the psychology of sex. What was that? Was that something that you were interested in from, you know, a young age? Is that something that's been more recent? It started from when I grew boobs and everybody, the world started reacting to me in weird ways and I couldn't work out why. <laughs> All right. Fair answer, very fair answer. <laughs> um, it's, been, it's been something I've been trying to figure out my whole life. It seems to be such, it seems to be in everything. Sex is just the underlying layer of in, every single interaction, whether we admit it or not, to ourselves even or not. Uh, and yet it's mm -hmm. something that's so taboo. And even now, um, if I just talk openly about the human sexual experience, even in non-explicit ways on Facebook, my fa my posts disappear. Like it seems, why, why have we got such fear about this thing? What is going on? But even more um, than that, we kept, I, see, I saw that the world is, um, sex educators are focused on, the physical skills of teaching to, and consent skills and how do you right. negotiate this kind of activity and how do you safely do this kind of kink um, and the relationship aspect of sex. But no one was really bringing satisfactory answers to why are we turned on by these bizarre things what is the psychological part of our turn-ons and why do they seem to be in conflict with our identity why do they seem to be mm. um it's not just them out there that have weird turn-ons we in here have weird turn-ons so how do we make sense of that what's going on like you know a feminist might love to submit and how, how do you make sense of that right it's right. all of these different did, so I really wanted to know. Um, but I also discovered um, through 30 years of sex geeking, so my somatic sexology is just one of the qualifications that I have, uh, mm -hmm. all sorts of different things, 30 years of, of diving deep and learning from some of the world's most experienced and pioneering sex experts. Um, but the, the most I learnt was the 12 years I spent as a full-time sex worker and professional dominatrix where I was paid to become the sexual fantasy 
thousands of people and I got to real time experience each person's fantasy and what happens if I trusted it and which parts I should bring to life which parts I shouldn't how do I how do what where does it take us inside of ourselves and together what kinds of states of consciousness does it open up inside of us what kinds of emotions do we get to feel what what is this thing and thousands of real life case studies of actually being in it living it in there with all of the body body fluids right that actually gave me a whole different perspective <laughs> than any sort of university degree <laughs> and that's where i thought that's where i really realized that the current dominant paradigms of uh, you know that psychologists and and the the, the the se- even the sex education community used to un- uh, explain and understand what sexual fantasies were was not adequate. There needed to be another thing. Mm-hmm. Something else was happening here. And I put my anthropology brain on and because <laughs> I also have an anthropology degree, have all of these different degrees, and, mm-hmm. um, and I've worked out what was happening and created a system around it to test it and got incredible results, and now I can teach it to people. So there you go. <laughs> You so you mentioned first of all you said that there is a, a, a prevailing theory of of sexual fantasy. What is the pre, what is the prevailing theory? So that then we can hear you know you did it right. Okay, okay. So there's a few different ones because you know humans don't tend to agree uniformly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, the common common ways that sexual fantasies are explained are that they are just brain, happy brain farts and we, everybody has them, they're happy and nat- they're natural, so don't think about them too much as long as you're not harming anyone, it's fine, which is, you know, that's a good enough theory of if you want, if you don't want to go any deeper with them, but you can't do anything with that. You can't right. use it, you can't make sense of it, you can't form a relationship with your erotic self. And if you, can, if you just say, I don't need to understand it, I'm just going to get off on it. So mm-hmm. um, it limits just how how effective you can be in creating real life play experiences too if you don't understand what the psychological thing is that makes you hot makes it hot for you um the another theory is that uh you know amongst sexologists the the Bible on the, the erotic mind is called The Erotic Mind by Jack Moran, which is a, an older book now, but still nobody has come up with a theory to replace it. And his his stuff is brilliant. It's absolutely very useful and it's a super insightful and was groundbreaking in its day. And I wouldn't be here if I wasn't standing on his giant shoulders. So all respect. There you go. But, <laughs> but um but he, in his own words, reduces all sexual fantasies to unfinished childhood and adolescent business. He's coming from that therapy model where everything is looking from that wounded to healing model. Sure. Right. Sure. So he's, everything is something is wrong that needs fixing model and, and fantasies are compensating for something broken your low self-esteem or your um, fear around this or your trauma, right? And that's Mm -hmm. true. These things absolutely can get processed through your sexual fantasies. But it's it's way too small of a theory if you think that that's the reason we have sexual fantasies, right? Sure. I mean, it seems like it minimizes minimizes their power, I, and I, I mean, I'm curious too, does, if we are always looking at these as some way, as, as, as a healing from a wound, you said the, the, the wounding and healing cycle, I don't think you used cycle, but I'm using that because it sounded good. <laughs> um, if you come from that, from that direction though, is this why we're, do you think that's part of why we're afraid to talk about it? Because it does mean you have to go way back and and think about the bad things that happened to you. You certainly would um, make you be afraid of fantasies in that way, but I have a different idea around that, and I'd like to tell you what my theory is so that then the question gets answered from a different frame. Oh, okay. Because that <laughs> that's going to change everything. That's why it's so important. <laughs> Do it. So my theory is that 
that even if we had the perfect childhood in the perfect accepting society, we would still have sexual fantasies that are about kinks and domination and power abuse and uh, non-consent and all sorts of things because they are serving a different purpose than than processing our trauma. There's, it's, they're, they're, they've got an inbuilt genius within them. So my theory is that sexual fantasies are inbuilt stories made by your own mind designed to change your state of consciousness. They're designed okay. to move you from your everyday state of consciousness into a place where you have let go of your guards. You've let your vulnerability show. You've it, it's you're dancing like nobody's looking. Everybody agrees that I've ever spoken to. The best peak question. experience of sex is when the, when you lose yourself in the moment. Right. right. Just like right. the best dancing is when you're not thinking about what you look like. You're just feeling it in every ounce of your your being and you feel in sync with whoever you're dancing with and maybe even the entire dance floor at the same time and it just feels incredible. Right. So sexual fantasies are stories designed to move us from our uh, everyday consciousness when we've got our inhibitions in place, our normal healthy ego guards protecting our sense of self in place, and protecting our, our identity, our dignity, <laughs> our social status, <laughs> and then to moving to a place where we let go of all of that so that we can connect with somebody else, so we can just drop into the experience fully. And you see parallels like this in all of the spiritual traditions pretty much and around the world. If you're going to get into this connected, open, even spiritual state of consciousness, you have to temporarily at least get your ego out of the way. Whether it's sure. prayer, whether it's, you know, trance, whether it's meditation, whether whatever flavor you want to take it in, it's still, um, it's, it is about temporarily losing this I, this I, and going into we, mm -hmm. and then maybe even the all, like connected with everything. And sex does that. It mirrors that exact same process. So then I wanted to look closer and see, well, what would be in the way of letting go? What would, what, even if you had the perfect childhood and the perfect society, what would still be in the way of changing consciousness, right? <laughs> letting go. Sure. Um, and that would be, and then I looked really close and I realised that, that sexual fantasies all had recognisable themes that you could, you could look at. And they were overcoming okay. three paradoxes so that you could let go. Right? And there's, th these are just inherent to sex. They're not, doesn't mean that you're wounded. Right? So the first paradox is just the internal paradox that you have going on. And a paradox, by the way, in this context means two contradictory rights. It's not a wrong and a right. It's a, two I things see. that are correct, but they're contradicting each other. And the, so there's an internal struggle between two correct things uh, and how am I going to re try and reconcile that thing? So the first one is this, I've got to protect my ego, my sense of self, my I. I need to have sure. healthy boundaries. I need to um, uh, know that I'm separate to you so that I can take care of my needs. I've got to make sure that I'm, I'm my, my reputation is okay so that I can be a member of the tribe and not cast out. <laughs> I have to make sure that um, you think that I'm good, otherwise I'm, I might not survive either. I've, I've got to keep my, my own identity of who I think I am, otherwise I might lose my own identity and then what happens? Right, speaking of identity, <laughs> which is your thing, right? Like, but it, um, right. right, this is who I am and that's who I'm not. I can't access this this sexual state because I might lose my identity, right? There's this thing that is going on in here. But then there's this other um, part of you, another organ of the psyche, if you like, that creates desires that is in conflict with that. And this other organ of the psyche that's, 
that creates sexual desires, and I just call it desire for the sake of it, like let's turn it into a little persona, like this ego talking to desire, right, little little, little <laughs> conversations. I <like> it. Yeah. <laughs> So um, each organ of the psyche has its own job, its own genius, and it's trying to look after you in a different way, but it has its own blind spots and limitations, right? So your ego is genius at protecting you and giving you a sense of identity and self, but it's terrible at connection because it's all about not letting any vulnerability in ever, right? Right, right. (laughs) So desire comes along as an organ of the psyche and says, ah, don't worry about that ego, my darling. (laughs) <laughs> don't worry about risk just go for it go desire is this urge to merge it's always this urge to merge in all of its forms even if it's the urge to merge with a damn donut it's, it's an urge to merge. <laughs> You're like, wait a minute <laughs> that is that is the origin that's the origin of the phrase uh, a flying fuck at a rolling donut right oh, there it? <laughs> the, the urge to merge with it? No, I don't think so. But it sounded pretty good, didn't it? I mean, the urge to merge with a donut. Yes. There excellent. we go. Brilliant. Sorry. <laughs> I, I told you I was going to have stupid tangents, and there's one. There's the first. <laughs> They're great. Please. So, so, so I get that. So, so there's there's internal you, you conflict want to protect your identity. Yeah. yeah. So desire wants to, you to lose your lose yourself so that you can have that moment of, of losing yourself and going into ecstasy like you would on the dance floor. And it's trying to convince you to lose yourself and let your guards down while ego is trying to protect yourself. There's your first paradox. They're both right. You do have to protect yourself and you do need to have to connect. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. How are you going to resolve this? And the friction between right. the two is what makes things sexually exciting. So it's sexual fantasies will tell stories that make you feel the friction between the two until it resolves itself. It comes up with a way to resolve itself for you so that you can access this desire place, at least temporarily. Right. So this is... Um, you know, you feel this conflict inside of yourself when you're sitting in a cafe and you get the hots for, you suddenly find the, the, the barista really attractive, like, woo, and you, and you will feel inside of yourself the conflict of your ego trying to protect your identity and never let you be vulnerable ever, playing it cool, pretending you're not interested. <laughs> right? Whereas um, desire will be fighting it and will be magnetically trying to get your attention on every move that they're making. So you so you'd be like, even though you you're steadily looking at your coffee, so you're not looking directly at them, your attention is fully on them. You're hyper aware, your senses are, are, are tuned in, and you try to think of a flimsy excuse that you can have to go over and talk to them that won't risk your vulnerability. Right. You're trying to find that. I get it. Feel the conflict yeah. in there, feel that tension. That same tension comes through in our sexual fantasies and that's what makes it exciting that's part of the turn on that that's transition between yes. self and other <laughs> yeah yeah now, that's agree. the first one do you want to hear the other two i was gonna say that's only number one yes <laughs> <laughs> the second paradox is self versus your lover because in order for you to let go So in order for you to lose yourself, you have to follow your own inner wisdom, the story your desire told you, because it's the perfect genius story that includes all of your ego's fears and the exact antidote to those fears to transform it so the end result is the opposite of what you feared it would be, right? So (laughs) you have to follow your own inner wisdom to be able to get to this juicy, erotic, turned-on state and be able to connect. But the other person has a different ego and a different desire, and their desire whispered a different dirty story in their ego's ear. (laughs) They've got different turn-ons, always, always, even if on the surface it appears as though they're they're similar. There's always going to be different nuances in the way that their ego feels safe to let go fully so who do you focus on do you focus on your turn-ons or their turn-ons 
the entire purpose of doing this together is so you can feel like you're in it together. Right. But you're different. Presumably. Yeah. Yeah. So you want to um, you want to get turned on together. You, most people really desperately want the other person to be turned on by the same turn-ons they are, otherwise they're not going to feel safe to let go. Of course. It's like, are you going down on me? Do you like going down on me? Are you doing this out of obligation? Have I taken up too much time receiving oral sex? Should I stop now and cap my pleasure uh, threshold uh, to give back to you because, you know, I should be a good person and care for you first as well? Or is, am I being, you know, can I take up more space? Or can I, you know, and, and this is when you get all of these stories, sexual fantasies that resolve this aspect for you. And they come through with your fantasies around things like, um, uh, you know, oh, I'm taking up too much time receiving oral sex, I should give back to you. Okay, I'm now being, you know, robbed and that the robber tied me up and and uh, is giving me as much oral sex as I can possibly take <laughs> exactly the way I like it <laughs> for as long as I can take it right I come tied I up I see I can't okay. give back right yeah okay I don't have to I care take you so now I'm allowed to receive for as long as I can and, and now I don't have to cap the thresholds worrying about you I can go as deep as I want to and even though there's right. absolutely cultural and gendered training to to either be the selfish person or the overgiver, that is a real thing that we need to address. Even if that wasn't there, that paradox would still be there because it's just inherently there. Who should I focus on, you or me? We both have different needs, and we're trying to feel this together. So yeah. that's that's paradox too. Um, <laughs> uh, and the third one is is self versus community, right? So it's how can I follow my own desire and still be a valued member of society? And this is there's always a conflict between what is good for the individual versus what's good for the collective. Sure, sure. There's also Those are social social expectations, yeah. There's also social oppression systems. That's a, a, a that's yes. a form of it. But that's even if they weren't there, there would still be a conflict between what is good for the individual versus what's good for the collective. And you you can figure it out okay. by asking this question is what would happen if I followed my own desire unbridled, unfiltered? What would happen to the fabric of society? <laughs> <laughs> you know that guy annoyed me. I, I think just, everything. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, I think everything will be awesome. I mean, you know, if everybody had really good sex, I think life would be a whole lot better. Yeah, that's not the point, though. This the point is if you followed your desire in the moment, like your desire would be, I'd never want to pay tax. Why would I pay tax ever? Oh, and then okay. I wonder why oh, there'd be no roads. <laughs> like if I followed my own. <laughs> If I followed my own hostels, there's no, there's no <laughs> hang on, what? Like uh, if if <laughs> if I um, if I just followed my own desire, uh, then I wouldn't turn up to the group activity that we all agreed to turn up to, and I just wouldn't contribute. Like it just, I'd sleep True. in because I'd focus on my own need for sleep more. And there is times when you should prioritise yourself over the community, but we are constantly navigating this every second of every day, this conflict of should I sacrifice my needs for the greater good or should I uh, focus on myself to go where I need to go? And we're navigating that. It, the answer is different every time. <laughs> oh, you're frozen. There you go. <laughs> So that can even yeah, you, can, a... you can even see that in in the example of you know a soldier. It's better for the soldier to protect their own individual life, but it's better for the country that they're trying to protect if that soldier obeys the commander because the army will be stronger and more effective. So it's right. There's not a single society that I know of that doesn't have a morality story that says to be a good person, you should sacrifice yourself for the greater good. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't think there is one. 
Yeah. So we have to find a way of following our own desire. We have to find a way of trusting our own desire when we don't trust it. We think it's going to ruin the fabric of society. And so our sexual fantasy has to whisper a little dirty story in our ear that convinces us that it's okay in this moment to follow our desire so that we can get to this sexy place, this sexy state of consciousness. Uh, it's, so it's going to whisper stories about, oh, you're afraid that you're going to go against the fabric of society. Let's make it being naughty exciting then. Let's make taboo exciting then. <laughs> <laughs> right. these sorts of embarrassment when you lose your social you're afraid you're going to lose face if you become a sexual being let's include that in your turn on then and or flip it on its head so that instead of being the thing that prevents you from accessing your turn on it is now got the poison and the antidote so that you now can use that very fear to, to create friction and change states of consciousness and access this juicy erotic state. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, that's significantly more complicated <laughs> than either of those two. I, I mean that in a good way, though, hmm. I, because, it, because it, I mean, <clears throat> it recognizes that we are beings who need these types of things, who need to to protect ourselves who need connection and who need a, a, a community. Mm. I mean, I think it's, it's, uh, it's I, I say connection. I really, you know, I was trying to get all three of your paradoxes and I didn't do a good job, but you, you know, did. we need to protect <laughs> ourselves. We need to, well, I mean, I like to, you know, you're, you, you had the, you know, am I getting too much oral? Is it too long? <laughs> 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 Which incidentally is like about half of what I think about. Doing sex. Is Half it? the time I'm like, oh, pretty much, yeah. Yeah. And then you're not the only one. It's pretty much everyone is no, like Oh, I doubt it, but <laughs> you're not the only one who's who's um uh thinking about am I taking up too much space? Am I too much? Um yeah. do you really want to be here with me? Do you do you want me? Am I desirable? These are the questions that we're dealing with when we're dealing with paradox number two, self versus lover. And somehow sexual fantasies have to resolve that. Do you really want to be here doing this with me or are you doing it out of obligation? Well, actually, let's create a scenario where there's an entire harem of you who want me and you're fighting over, over who gets to give me oral today. <laughs> Right. Oh, yes, you do want to be here. Okay, I am wanted. Okay, fine. My ego is so blown up now I can let it relax. <laughs> like, <yeah. laughs> you see how these fantasies are directly resolving these fears, these egoic fears, so that yes. we just let go. That's, yes. that's why they're recognisable themes again and again and again. And when, as a sex worker, if I listened to people's sexual fantasies, I sat them down on my red velvet couch and asked them all these questions and, you know, had a little tea ceremony with them and um, uh, they didn't realise that they were giving away so much more information than they, than they realised when they were just telling me about their fantasies. I, I, asked, I learned to ask the right questions and I asked. I didn't try and live out their, their fantasy as it was in their mind's eye. That's the mistake that most people make. They think, oh, you want a threesome, so we have to now go and have a threesome. You want a gangbang, so now we have to go have a gangbang. You want to be dominated by a CEO billionaire. Now we have to go find ourselves a Right. And, you know, you okay, you want to be put in a glory hole and used by you know, a bunch of um, fantasy Smurfs. Okay, I don't have any Smurfs in my cup. What am I going to do? <laughs> so it's it's um uh, yes, there really are Smurf fantasies out there. By the way, so <laughs> I I was yeah, I wasn't. I didn't want to follow up on that, but thank you, I did. <laughs> so, but so how do so how do you end up? Hmm. <laughs> So, so how do you end up following up on that? Like, how do you go, okay, well, fantasy Smurfs, let's say, like, how do you, how do you, you said you, you listen, you, you listening to the spirit of it more to the, the, the word, like the CEO billionaire. So what, what's the, I mean, so what is the spirit? 
Mm -hmm. So you have to ask yourself the question. <laughs> you have to ask yourself the question. How did their state of consciousness change from one to the other? How did this fantasy resolve this fear? And you ask, ask these three questions. If this person, what does this person believe would happen if they followed their desire impulses moment to moment without any filters or consent worries or anything? They just followed it. The impulse, what do they believe would happen to themselves? How would they harm themselves? How would they harm their lover? And how would they harm the fabric of society? And this is how they, this is what they, they need to overcome so that they can trust their own desire and follow it like a compass to where they need to go. So what I'm listening for is how did that get resolved? What was the body language and the attitude? What was the power dynamic? What was the poison? What was the antidote? What, and I'm looking at like a story. What, where's the story arc going here? What, what are the characters? Yeah. What are the themes that have been overcome? How did, how did that work? And then when I've got a sense of that, I don't sit there and intellectually plan what I'm going to do as a scene. I've just now got a sense of what they need and I will spontaneously go into playing with um, those exact themes, making sure that I include both the poison and the antidote. Otherwise the friction will I not see. be there. Sure. You have to include oh. both. So let's That's give an example cool. of um, the, like there's a really common um, uh, uh, sexual fantasy. There's lots and lots of um, search engine um, people searching for this. And let's say again, people don't necessarily fantasize about things they want to do in real life. They're fantasizing about something that will create a psychological effect on them. So think about it like that before. <laughs> so okay. they, they, you know, stepmother um, or step, some step person in your life theme could come along, right, where, where that's taboo, right, already you're breaking society's norms. Oh, my God, we can't do that. The fabric of society will collapse if, if we break the <laughs> nuclear family. <up. laughs> Taboos. Exactly. See, that's right there. Um and do they really want me? Yes, they really want me because they're willing to risk losing everything in order just to give right. me up. <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, so let's just imagine that somebody has come in and they've they've told me that they've got this stepmom fantasy. And I'll have to ask because everybody who has, it's not uniform. The one, next person who has the stepmom fantasy is going to have different versions, different nuances of it. Nobody is, there's not just one, like it's not like dream interpretation where you go, oh, this fantasy means the same thing every time. You have to listen to each person. But say this person came in and said, and I, I dug and I found out, why is it so exciting that stepmom wants you? Where's the charge in that? Uh, is it because, you know, it's so naughty? And they might be uh, focused on, oh, no, it's actually not because the emphasis for me is that it's important that it's naughty, but it's that's not the emphasis. The importance is um, not the fear of getting caught. That's not, that's not what's exciting to me. What's exciting is that she wants me so badly, she's willing to just sack, lose everything in order to be with me. So that convinces me, yes, she really does want to be here doing this with me and now I can let go and just receive the pleasure and not, not worrying about caretaking her because obviously she's taking care of her own needs by doing this, right? So it's really convinced them. It's like, okay, okay, that's what's what's hot for you. But I don't want to play role play stepmom every single time we have sex. That will get old. So... <laughs> What, uh, another way of doing that same thing would be to just go um, just one day, just just leave it to the last minute before going to work and, and saying, oh, um, oh, I just want you so bad. Oh, but I've got to go to work. Oh, but I, I, oh, I, I just, I'll just be a little bit late. Oh, I just can't resist you. Oh, <laughs> oh, they go, oh, no, I won't have time for a shower. They're going to smell sex on me. They'll know. Oh, but I just can't help it. I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> and then have a sexual encounter with that. And when they see that internal struggle in me and the fact that they want, it will have exactly the same psychological yeah. effect and take them where they need to go. I think that's amazing. I don't <laughs> think there's anything more I can say. 
<laughs> so this is this is the it's art was, form. <laughs> it's an art form. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Hmm. There was a um I spoke to somebody a few weeks back, it was maybe it was a month or so ago, who who had put together different uh, really a personality assessment. I swear this comes back to you. Trust me. I'm not just talking about like, you know, there's a real purpose here, but mm -hmm. he, he did like a personality assessment. And it sounds like, like you could use some of these fantasies to figure out really the, the deeply seated motivations that we have, like the real, what makes us tick the real, yeah. the real, real person. Yeah, really. This is so, this is, I you're wish. right. You're right. And when I teach people the divinary method, because that's what I do now, I teach therapists, I teach sexperts, I teach um, self discovery, um, people who yeah. want to use a, the erotic as a, a lens for deep self discovery and play forever. Um, yeah. I teach people how to do what I did in the divinery. And the divinery was just the name of the sex work venue that I had in Sydney when I was a professional dominatrix and also a okay. erotic massage person and also vanilla sex. So it's not just BDSM. It's all of the spectrum that I did. So <laughs> um, they, it's therapists are getting super excited when I teach them this. Like, and I teach them, through practice, you can't just learn this as a, as a hearing. I don't mean that we have sex together. I mean I teach them exercises to do so they can feel what I'm talking about. An example would be sure. you started to understand it more when I gave the story of the of the um, the cafe when you could feel the conflict, inner conflict going between you. When you can feel it at work and you start doing practices that you can actively form a new trusting relationship, an allyship with your desire, it does not just improve your sex life. It is it ripples out into everything. It ripples out like therapists are now using the divinery method with their their clients on every matter. They can see, oh, that's what's actually happening here as well. And in this area, with your job and with your relationship and with this and with that. Like it's just once you see it, you can't unsee it. And once the methods are in place, it, it just creates a, a, a much better life. I'm just using sexual fantasies as the doorway in, right? but it's, it's there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can, yeah. If what you're, if what you're looking to do is tear down the walls between or that you've constructed around yourself, like I can't imagine a better way of doing it than saying, let me analyze, you know, ultimately what, what, what I feel would, would make me, uh, most open. I'm I've I'm stuttering some because I have so many thoughts going through my head. I mean, it's so fascinating. You you're writing a book too, right? I looked around for it. Yes, it's, it should come out in 2025, and depending on how many edits I have to do, uh, um, April 2025 is the, okay. is the goal. Um, but if I have to do more rewrites, then oh, yeah, I know. Oh. <laughs> But still, if you get on my mailing list and then you'll make sure that you get it when it comes out because I give away lots, yeah. of, lots of lots of juicy insights about the erotic psyche on my mailing list, by the way. Okay. Okay. So um, the, the thing is we're walking through the world motivated by desire all the time. In fact, we don't even get off the couch anytime without some sort of desire for a peanut butter sandwich popping into our consciousness. Like we just, <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> we just, desire is the motivating force. And we're constantly, like people are trying to get, I need another billion dollars because the $17 billion I already have is not enough. Like we're, we're motivated unconsciously in this relationship and we don't trust it. Everyone's trying to manifest their desires, their dreams, to make them come true without trusting this force without forming a relationship mm. with it without understanding it and when you use the divinery method you form an, um, an embodied relationship a two-way conversation on a body level with this force inside of you and it's no longer something you need to suppress because you're afraid of it or just give in to and then cop the consequence hangover without any thought if there's a third way of right. being with this where you can get all of its wisdom and trust its genius because it is a genius. It is yeah. the only 
force, the only organ of the psyche that knows the way to connection. It's the only organ of the psyche that knows the way to true satiation because it created the desire in the first place. Mm -hmm. So it is the one we have to follow to get there, right? (laughs) You know, it's so fascinating, though, because it's it struck me a lot of times. So I'm going to talk about my not actual bits of my fantasies, but I will say oftentimes, <laughs> oftentimes when when I have had a fantasy fulfilled, I get a sense of shame. Mm-hmm. So why? But how about if I stop? Why? Question mark. <laughs> shouldn't, I, shouldn't I have? Well, I mean, shouldn't I have gone? Hey, look, I was open, and this was phenomenal. All right, I'm going to stop. <laughs> I thought it was going to stop. Why? Yeah. That's a that's an excellent question. Thank you for asking it. <laughs> sure. So, what I noticed is that most people have never actually resolved all three paradoxes in their life. They've got halfway there. They've half trusted their desire, which has made it hot. They've got the, they've they've followed part way through the the their underlying narrative, but they haven't hit all of the poisons and the antidotes to get the full transformation to take them where they need to go. So if you imagine yourself inside your castle walls, you're you're protecting yourself, you're being a self, you're not being connected lover and we or, you know, having a oneness experience with the universe, you're just being a self inside your castle walls and your ego is your castle walls. It's protecting you so that you have a sense of self. You even know that you're a sense of self. It's a very important part of you, right? (laughs) Useful, but... um, But you need to temporarily step outside of the castle walls if you want to connect, if you want to move from I to we, or if you want to move from I to we to everything that is. (laughs) Go really deep into it. So on your way out of the castle walls, you're going to meet three guards standing there and they're not going to let you pass unless you have the, you can convince them that you're going to, you're still be safe if you get passed because their whole job is to keep you safe. And those three guards, are they going to protect your self-identity? I'm this kind of person, not that kind of person. I'm a masculine man. I don't be vulnerable. Only those sissy sluts are vulnerable. So then you have a fantasy about being (laughs) being a sissy slut and it turning out to be okay, right? (laughs) Sure, (laughs) sure. But um, uh, it's... You know, I'm a feminist. I don't. I don't want to submit. You know, I don't want someone to have power yeah. over me. So then you have to address that fear. You have, in order to address and transform a fear, you have to include it in the story. Otherwise, it can't get. Re, it can't get transformed. Has to be included. And uh, you know, so your self identity, your self worth. Do you really want to be here doing this with me? That guard has to be answered. Yeah. Right. That, do you desire me? Um, and the, and this last one, how, you know, your social status, which is linked to your community paradox, right? Your, yeah. um, how, you know, if the world knew that I was a sexual being, they'd think I was a whore. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I can't possibly. So then you get turned on by being like, called a whore. So, then, <laughs> but so oh, you find, okay. right. So these are, you have to include the poison. But most people, and that will turn you on because desire is like a little compass and it's playing this game with you all the time going, yeah, you're on the right track, warmer, warmer, warmer. Oh, yes, hot, 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 that's the the right one, yes. And it's it's got excited, but you still haven't found the whole goal. You haven't processed all the way through to the end. You haven't included the full antidote to all three guards. Mm -hmm. Then if you get, you can totally get off. You can have amazing orgasms, feel amazing, and still feel unsatisfied in some way or some sort of shame hangover afterwards if you have not included yeah. the antidotes to each of those poisons as well. Like, and they're encoded in your fantasies. So once you know, you know how, yeah. what they are, you can listen to them and play with them uh, on purpose. And suddenly that used to happen to me all the time as a sex worker. People would, you know, experience people who had been in the kink scene, uh, BDSM clubs for 30 years, thought they knew it all when they came through the door, had experienced everything, gave clear instructions of what they wanted, communicated clearly, and they'd, <laughs> and I'd listen to their fantasies and I'd realise that they'd never hit all three guards, poisons and antidotes. Oh, 
Mm. And I go, okay, I'm going to play a game. And I, and I bring those three things to life. I'll focus on that, bringing that to life within our real-life play experience, and, they, and they're blown away. They're, they're like, I did not know I could feel this way. What even was that? What does this, yeah. what is this? This feels, let's say this, this comment came up a lot. This, I feel so alive. I feel like who I always was, but I didn't know how to get to. I feel like the, this is the real me. This is, this is like being on psychedelics and on ecstasy at the same time, except the opposite because it's so grounded and so real. Hang on. What even? And it's, they're having a spiritual experience. They came in to do some dirty, smutty thing, and they've never in, <laughs> and come out going, "What? I was just one with the universe. <laughs> I just found my right. soul." Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's the biggest bummer there is that we do. You know, you ha- you use the word silly and smutty, and like those are bad. Yeah. No, 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 they're not because you're going to have this oneness with the universe. It, it's, right. They it, save it's money because. That... Yeah. So, go ahead. Sorry. Well, that's why I called my book what I did. You know, it's called The Spirituality mm. of Smart, right? The paradox right, right. there. Like, <laughs> uh, this, and uh, yeah, the, the surprising wisdom of sexual fantasies. So I take everyone right through yeah. all of the stories of how I figured this out and how and the techniques that I used in that book so that you can learn about this for yourself and bring that to life. So make mm-hmm. sure you, you get hold of that when it comes out. <laughs> yeah, no, I would love to. Is that, that is a... Um... Would it be like the handbook of the divinery method or no? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. There's some things you're just going to still come and need to learn with me because there's practices. The things that really make it ground is doing the practice uh, once you have mm-hmm. the intellectual understanding. But, yeah, I'm going to be as helpful as I possibly can. But if you want to start right now, you can join the monthly seminars that I run. I focus on a different aspect of the divinery method uh, on an online training every month for two hours. So that's a, that's an accessible way of learning if you don't want to become my trainee and learn the entire thing. <laughs> right? so that's that's another way to join in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm dying to get this book. I saw, <laughs> I saw it on your website and I'm like, maybe it's on Amazon. Yeah. Maybe not yet. it's on Goodreads. Maybe. It's, so yeah. yeah, I think, I think this will open up so many minds. Mm-hmm. I, I have no doubt this will open so many minds. Well, it's phenomenal because people, people don't will, will stop trying to get their desires met in the wrong ways. Once they understand how to get their real mm-hmm. desires met. So you're going to get a whole lot of people trying, being less sneaky, less manipulative, less um, non-consensual, and you're going to get a whole lot of people who um, who thought that they were pleasing each other before, were, and they didn't actually really know what each other needed, and now they do. Right? There's going to, it's, right. it's going to be huge. It's huge. So. Ugh. <laughs> And a whole lot of people who who don't think that they're broken because there's an awful like millions of people right now are convinced that their sexual fantasies are there because of their childhood traumas. They think and because and because um, sexual fantasies may in fact incorporate your childhood trauma. They might okay. because anything that is in the way of getting you to that wonderful state that your birthright to connect and be connected with oneness, anything that's in the way is going to come through in your, your psyche is going to find a way to resolve it for you so that you can get there. That makes sense. Right? Yeah. So, so not, not created by any traumas, but, but could certainly help. Well, would you, would you say that's both poison and antidote there? Is, it, is that? If, if somebody is, have, has had a history of trauma, and they are now fantasizing about that trauma. I'm, I, I, I'm willing to bet, and I'm not a psych, I'm not a therapist. <laughs> I'm willing to bet that the story has changed. They're reliving it in a way that they've taken their power back in some way. It's now them getting their oh. needs. The thing that used, robbed them of their power has now been turned into. Some, it's it's been transformed, and this is, yeah. this is how it is. So trauma I, may I just, might come through. 
Yeah. I just get the biggest, deepest chill from that. The idea that you've But it's not the reason it, that we have that this sexual this, fantasies. This trauma, you've reclaimed that, that, that mm. the person before the trauma. I think mm. that's beautiful. Mm. This is another reason I always it's trust desire. Chill. Yeah? So yeah. important. Super important. But we need the skills in place to be at, you, you can't just jump in the deep end. You have to start by forming a relationship with desire itself. And that's what I teach. The very first part of the divinary method is the desire compass. How do you actually mm. step by step form a very practical, very embodied, very real relationship, allyship with this organ of the psyche inside of yourself? And then yeah. how do you hold yeah. hands together and work through your fantasies and how then do you bring them to life? How do you invite people into this when they don't know this method? How do you ask for what you really need and how do you find out what they really need when they're not even conscious of it? <laughs> so that's what I teach. Yeah. This this is, I, I think also you should really, you should write the script. Do you remember, you know those Inside Out movies? Do you no. know the movies I mean? no. Oh, it's oh, inside yeah. out. It was a really so so with the the emotions, right? The mm. they they're all personified. Mm. I I think you could write Inside Out three, right? The kids <laughs> got to hit write. puberty at some point. <laughs> yeah, adults only. Kids got to hit puberty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, that's, that's internal perfect. family systems. I think that 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 movie was made out of based I, on that I which i so. didn't i didn't know yeah. internal family systems was a thing when i started up with the organs of the psyche i just made up a story in order to be able to make sense of the, the things that were going on inside of myself and i was noticing in my clients so the organs of the psyche theory is fleshed out more in my book and it has uh, it is different to internal family systems but it's a happy coincidence mm -hmm. that it seems that other people have already also discovered that this is a good way of doing things right 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 yeah. yeah right so i i see we're we're a, li we're a bit low on time here so i want to ask you now you know how does everybody find you on the internet i've i've got uh i've got four four links here i held up three fingers <laughs> like you do but how do we find you on the internet because this is this is such fascinating work so amazing work so tell tell me how we find artemisia divine on the the internet well, um, I have a freebie, which apparently the link hasn't been working, which is a shame. People have probably been trying to sign up and failing. But um, I have a freebie, which is um, the celeb swoon technique, which is a little little exercise you can do to start straight away. You can start going, how do I bring out, how do I become aware of my unconscious narrative? How do I do that? And this will walk you through an exercise looking at um, celebrities that you find swoon worthy and uh, discovering the, uh, the right kinds of questions to ask yourself in order to be start becoming aware of what's happening there. Um, and you can look at that at myfantasyis.com. Um, and, uh, but my website is actually artemisiadivine.com. So if the, if the other one doesn't work, just go straight to my name. It's like, it's really important for anyone in the sex um, industry or sexuality field that you follow their their newsletter rather than I mean you're welcome to join my my social media but it's alg algorithm muted I might get a billion followers and three of them will see what I post so um, in order to uh, be able to have real conversations about being real humans with real complexity you're going to need to get on my mailing list um, and I, I'm very generous, as I said on there. I, I give you so many case studies and insights and things. And I just started a sub stack as well, by the way. It's free. Um, oh, there you go. Uh, yeah. And I'm slowly uploading all of the um, past blogs that I've written for years with lots of details on okay. there so you can follow that as well. An excellent way to get on there, which is just, again, my name, Artemisia Divine. So <laughs> you can follow me Okay. There. That's awesome. I will, I will do that. Cause I'm on Substack too. I will definitely, I will definitely connect there. I did not, I will admit. So my fantasy is.com. Do you want to make sure at least at the moment of this recording, use HTTPS. This was a, a thing that I, that I so troubleshot earlier today. I have not gone through it. I was going to do it last night and I was like, Oh dang. And I was <laughs> waiting on it. So 
So I, I messed with it today, and I have yet to go through the whole shebang. But I'm, I'm after this conversation, I'm, I'm just dying to do this. Well, so there's the freebie, and there's also the freebie, but also this month the divinery method um, seminars that I do. I'm also focusing on the celeb mm. swoon technique, and I'm going to have uh, oh. real people live, and you can watch me uh, bring the, bring out the right information and you get a lot more information out of it than you could on your own. So there's also that as well. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. All right. So cool. Gosh, this is, I, you know, I've really, this was a great conversation. Thank you so much for, for explaining some of these things. I, I expect like no joke. I'm not just trying to blow sunshine up your skirt. Like I expect when your book comes out that it could change a lot of, you know, how we view ourselves. And, and that's, that's awesome. I'm thank you for, for bringing this to the world. Thank you. Yeah, and it took a whore to do that. So celebrate whores. <laughs> Cut it out. Cut it. Don't use the word. No, I do. Whore. What? Whore is a good word. Whore okay. was always a good word. It was made bad by people who thought oh, that we were know, shameful. So I take it back. It's mine. Perfect. Perfect. Reclaim that, right? There you go. Yeah. Whore. But it, it's, <laughs> I tell you, just, you know, there is nothing better than the idea that the world will improve through 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 the work of through the work of a whore. Then that's I think it's great. Yeah, so many people are going to be clutching pearls. You know, if, if that <laughs> your book comes out, a lot of people will be clutching pearls. <laughs> Mildred, did you hear? <laughs> uh -huh. And I will rejoice. <laughs> <laughs> it's lovely to talk to you and I must run, but um, I look forward to, um, uh, you know, maybe having another conversation when my book comes out and I can go into specific oh, fantasies with you. <laughs> I would love that. I would love that. So, well, let me go. So I'll go ahead and shut this down. Um, I do want to thank Every all of the all of our listeners, I can't even talk. I want to thank all of your list, all of our listeners, yours too. <laughs> Holy cats! Should I try this again? <laughs> Thanks everybody who listened. I'm Amethyst Deharic. I've been speaking with Artemisia Divine on Gender Identity Weekly, where we have talked about sexual fantasies and what it reveals about you. So thank you again, Artemisia. Okay. <laughs>